Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, GSC 102 stream. Uh, it's our launch year for the 2021 virtual conference. And uh, this is our third session uh, by Mark Wilson, which is at RACF 102 uh, with the SysProgs. Uh, any questions throughout, if you could put them in the chat, please, and I'll field them to uh, field them to Mark. We won't be unmuting. We'll have to do it all via chat. Uh, then just at the end of the session, if everybody could make sure to give feedback, please, for, the, for it. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat towards the end as well. Um, Mark, over to you. Thanks very much, David, and good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks for turning up at this ungodly hour, nine o'clock. Well, who came up with this idea? Nine o'clock sessions at a GSE conference. Wow. Um, as David said, Mark Wilson, I, uh, I work for BMC Software. I'm the um, director for uh, mainframe services. Um, and today we're going to have a, a very high level chat about um, RACF 102 and, and kind of an intro to RACF from a SysProx perspective. We're not going to go into a great deal of, of detail. I'm just going to give you lots of pointers of, of things to look at and explain how some of this stuff works at the 10,000 foot level. The idea being that you will have bits you can go and look at yourselves afterwards. The session code is 6Alpha Sierra, 6AS for your feedback. Um, and as David said, we'd love to get your feedback just so we, from a GSE perspective, we know the stuff that you like and the, and the stuff you don't like. Um, so we've got the agenda here. Um, talk about the Rack of Systems Programmers Guide, talk about SAF, database modules, utilities, control blocks, macros, exits, and then questions. You'll be pleased to know that I've trimmed the number of slides down. When I actually wrote this, I had 128 slides in the deck, and I thought that may be a little too many. Um, so it is going to be fairly fast paced. Um, so I'm going to try and get through as much of this as we possibly can. One thing I will say, you know, if you want more of this, then reach out to Dave and Chris and I'll quite happily do virtual sessions on each one of the different areas. There literally is an hour's presentation on every single one of these, of these topics that we can, we can actually go through. A um, little bit of an introduction. Um, I'm a mainframer and have been a mainframer since May 1980. I started at the tender age of 16 as a trainee computer operator you can see that black and white photograph there. That's a 3420 tape drive with 3420 tapes behind. There was, there was no automation. If, if, the, if the programmer or the, the systems programmer or the batch job or the applications programmer wanted data that was residing on a tape, we walked into the tape room, we picked it off the rack, we went and we mounted it and pressed the buttons. We then moved to automatic tape libraries. Then we moved to you know, virtual tapes where there's really no physical tape. So that's where I started. And now, yeah, have the pleasure of leading this mainframe services team, working on the new shiny stuff, the, you know, the, the Z15 and all the software and stuff that, 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 goes, that goes along with it. You may ask, why is there a, a gray battle cruiser on this uh, chart? I was actually going in the Navy. I went to do mainframe computing at a, a local engineering firm in 1980 for something to do for six months before I went in the Navy. Here I am, 41 years later, um, trying, to, uh, trying to teach you all a little bit about um, RACF from a systems programmer's perspective. So as David said, questions in the chat window, uh, are happy to take them as we go along. So RACF for systems programmers. Okay, now we know the mainframe ZOS runs sorry, the world. Sorry, Mark, one moment. Um, Eamon's just put in the chat, he's having trouble seeing the slides. Could you ask anyone else to comment if they're having trouble? Yeah, is anybody else having issues seeing the slides? I, I, I can personally see them fine. Yeah, yeah, Wendy can see them, Andy, Alexi, no problems there. Eamon, I think that might be you. Um, you may need to drop off and, and come back on again. Thanks. Yeah. OK, thanks, David. So, look, we know how important the mainframe is, runs the economy of the world, system of engagement, system of record. Yeah, the, it, it, it's been doing cloud stuff since 1964. We've virtualized everything from 1964 onwards. So, yeah, I'm a mainframe bigot. OK, what's a systems programmer do? OK, well, summed up in one very, very uh, yeah, relevant hoodie, I think. Yeah. If you were a systems programmer, you solve problems that people don't know they have in ways that they can't understand. That's what we do. We fix stuff. 
and we fix stuff because we understand how it works. And if you really want to understand how Rakev hangs together, one of the most important manuals is the Rakev or Security Server Rakev Systems Programmer God. Here's the 2.5 version. Um, everything I say in this in this presentation, you should go and validate in the Systems Programmer God. Some of it we, you will need to look in other manuals, think things like the, the Rack Root manual, okay? But the Systems Programmer God is where you go and look for all of the information about you know, how this stuff hangs together. And if you're serious about this stuff, you print it off, you have it on your desk. Yeah, I'm old fashioned. I like pens and highlighters and post-it notes so I know where things are. Okay. That's the book that you need. At a 10,000 foot view, how does it work? Okay. Well, simply, RACF, not even RACF, a resource manager such as TSO, Kicks or HSM or, or any other product that runs or piece of software that runs on the mainframe makes a call to the security interface and asks the security interface a question. And I say security interface at the moment because there are two different ways of doing this. That question is answered by way of either reading information in the RACIF database or copies of the profiles held in storage. Now we hold them in storage for performance reasons, largely for fast access, for speed, we want a fast response. So the resource manager asks RACF a question, RACF returns a sequence of answers. The three most common ones are return code zero, the answer to your question was yes, return code eight, the answer to your question was no, and return code four, yeah, I don't know. Really what it's saying is I don't have any information to give you an answer on. So the resource manager then has to decide what to do with that answer. And this is where it gets really interesting because the resource manager could decide to ignore what Rakef has said. It could come back and say, Mark's not got access. But you could have some code in the resource manager that says if it's Mark, then don't then give him access, irrespective of what Rack says. Okay, so that's how this works. You've got this database, that little green database there that has a set of profiles in it. We'll come on to those in a moment. But the resource manager asks Rack a question and gets an answer back: zero, four, or eight. That's simply how it works. Now. The resource manager can talk directly to RACF. RACF has a set of macros, a set of interfaces it can talk directly to RACF. Or it can go through what's known as the RAC root or SAF interface. Now, we'll cover that a little bit later, yeah, just in a little bit more detail. But think about it as the resource manager asks RACF a question. RACF gives back the resource manager an answer. And the resource manager, nine times out of 10, honors or agrees with what Rakev said. But you've got to assume yeah, that the resource manager is actually asking the question because there are some software products you can turn around and say, yeah, I don't want security on, don't talk to Rakev. Assumption number two is that the resource manager does not override the decision made by Rakev. Now, we, we, we should check that the resource manager is calling RACF. We should also check that the resource manager is not overriding. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Okay. Assumption three, we've got all the right profiles. Assumption four, that the return code in what we call the class descriptor table, again, more on that later, handles that return code for not found, don't have any information, is either defaulting to return code zero, allow, or return code eight, the access is denied. And the fifth one is, yeah, if we've got profiles in storage, assuming they are correct, because of course, when you change the RACF database, you don't change the in storage version. So you have to tell RACF 
Racklist refresh to copy the profiles from the Rackliff database to storage. If you don't do that, you could have access granted on the database that's not reflected in the in storage profiles. So you have to assume you've done all of this and everything's right. Okay. So 10,000 foot view, that's how it works. Resource manager talks to Rackf. Rackf gives them back an answer, zero, four or eight. Resource manager honors that, okay? Simple. Rackf database, 10,000 foot view. One or more sequential data sets. People talk about the Rackf database. It's not a database like DB2 or IMS or Oracle, or even access on your Windows system. It's actually a sequential data set that's formatted, pre-formatted. However, with 2.5, you can have your RACF database defined as a VSAM linear data set. But if you read the 2.5 manual, there are a lot of restrictions. We haven't got time to go through all of those if you wanna move from yeah, traditional RACF databases to linear, you need to read the SysProgs guide. It's got a whole sequence of what are known as index and data blocks. The data, the actual rack of profiles, the index is how do you get to that data? There are four rep basic record types in the rack of database. The remote, there's more information in there, things like your, 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 your system settings, set ops, but four basic profiles, users, groups, data set, and general resource. That's all that's in this database. Now, we map them using what are known as RACF database templates, okay? They exist in multiple places. They used to be shipped by IBM a few versions of ZOS, ZOS ago as a sequential data set text file you could browse. They're now actually in load module format, okay? We have three, three, three locations for them. You've got the load module, the version that's been written to the database and an in storage version of them, okay? Now, you've got to, you know, understanding how these work and how they are refreshed, yeah, is a, is a whole section in the database. But, but think about it as the, as the data layout for your RACF database. RACF databases, you can have more than one, okay? Now, typically, most installations run with one primary database and one backup database, and the changes made to the primary are replicated to the backup. However, if you have a heavily utilized RACF database, you can split that RACF database using what's known as the range table. And the range table says that these profiles will reside in data set A, these profiles will reside in data set B, these profiles will reside in data set 3. You can have up to 90, 90 primary RACF databases with the corresponding 90 backup databases. I have to say I've been doing this a few years now. I've only ever come across two sites out of hundreds that split the RACF databases. If you do use the, if you do split it, you've got to define the ranges and where they go in the range table. And you also have to tell what's known as the database names table, ICH RDSNT, or the new Palmly member that we'll come on to in a moment, yeah, that you've got multiple primary and multiple backups. You can share these RACF databases. You can actually share it without a sysplex. So the, um, the, the, um, the options are, are contained in, the, in the, um, the, the ICB, the first block of that primary um, RACF database. And if you wanted to get into any of the GRSL MIM stuff, it serializes access to that database using the reserve macro. So you can have, if you're doing a long running task on a database on one LPA, you can lock out another LPA because literally you are just sharing like this. Yeah. So you can have four LPAS sharing a single RACF database. It's very rudimentary. Yeah. Most people these days share within a, a sysplex. And we do that using a coupling facility. And it allows us to propagate refreshes and rack lists and global changes. Also does the co coordination of the RVARI command. But you can also 
do a data sharing parallel sysplex from a RACF perspective. And this is where all of the LPARs are sharing the single set of profiles loaded into the coupling facility. Okay, so we cache them in the coupling facility. This is where you would want to be in a high volume, yep, um, si highly active cisplex environment. So you've got a number of LPARs sharing profiles in the coupling facility and RACF moves the profiles in and out of the coupling facility as it sees fit based on the amount of storage you've got defined in the coupling facility for your RACF database. The first gotcha of this presentation, okay, is the rvary command. The reason it's a gotcha is you do not need any special attributes, RACF system special or RACF auditor to issue the rvary command. You can use it to deactivate a RACF database. You can use, if you've got that pair, to move the primary to the backup. So you do what's known as a switch. So the, the primary gets switched to the backup. This becomes the primary and the primary gets deactivated. Okay. You can turn data sharing mode on and off. Okay. You can issue this command from a TSO, well, TSO address space, either TSO or in batch, or from the MVS console. You have to be really, really careful with this because if you accidentally or on purpose deactivate your primary and backup database at the same time RACF goes into a mode called failsoft and failsoft has to ask the operator every single security question it was going to ask RACF can David have access to sys1.palmlib can Mark have ups, update access to catalog.user.tso? Those appear on the consoles as WUTOs, and you have to reply yes or no. So you act in as RACF. What you will most likely see happen is the console buffer will fill, and then the, the LPAR will stall. The only way to get out of this is to IPL. So our very is very, very powerful, OK? Um, as I've mentioned, any user can issue the RVARY command. And the reason any issue can, any user can issue the RVARY command, it's protected by a password stored in the RACF database. So there's a separate password for the status, whether you want to activate or deactivate, and there's a separate password for the switch. The IBM supply default has three letters. Uh, we don't we don't have an interactive chat window or we do let me get the chat window up so who wants to have a guess at what the default r very password is and it's not ibm it's only got three letters i'm going to type it in the chat window because we don't yes Jez, Tom Z. <laughs> Tom, you know it's not Jez. You know it's yes. So yes, it is absolutely correct. It's yes. So this is why you have to be very, very careful with this. It's documented in the manual. Okay. So if somebody got access to your master console, walked into the machine room or got access to the master console on somebody's desk, they can just top it, walk in, um, R very, deactivate, sys1.racf.prim, type in yes, Matt. Primary racket database is deactivated. You're now in fail soft mode. So you've got to be really careful with that. Okay. So next little section. RACF modules. There are lots of them. We're not going to talk about all of these, but you've got database name and range table, class descriptor table, router table, started procedures table, authorized caller table, naming conventions and security initialization options. They reside in different places. Some reside in the linked list, some reside in, in LLA, okay? Um, we're gonna talk about a couple of them. Um, if you're, this is where you need to go to the, the RACF manuals and, and, and dig in and look at what all of these do in detail. 
But the, the first one, and the one that we all have to wrap our heads around as Rackev Systems programmers, is the database names table. It defines the name of the primary and the backup. It de determines whether they are going to be duplexed primary to backup. Um, defines the use of the sysplex. Defines the number of resident data blocks. Okay, check the book for that. It's just a little bit of storage usage. But this was a static table. You had to assemble it, link it, re-IPL. IBM as of 2.4 allows you to define it in a parameter library, IRR, PRM, XX, where XX is 00, zero through ZZ. Um, as it says there, see, see the info on the left for what you need. But if you look at an example here, it says, well, here are my database options. Yeah. Am I going to be in sysplex mode, no comms, comms or data sharing? Here's the name of the primary. Here's the name of the backup. I'm going to update everything to the backup. Here's my buffers, and here's my range, should I want to use that, that range table. Okay, so you can do all of this in the, the, the parameter library now. So you don't have to go and, and look, at the, look at the assembler macro and build the load module to do this anymore. Do it in Palmlib, so much easier. Um, as I said, yeah, I mentioned before, the, the range table, it's a way of splitting or distributing I.O. across multiple um, RACF databases. This really does go back to the days of when we had actual spinning disks, you know, 3330s and 3350s and 3380s. Now, most, most of them are on super fast spinning um, disks or, or on um, SSDs. So you know, not as valid these days, but you might come across it. But the range table said, put these profiles on this database, put these profiles on, on this database. That's how it works. You've then got the class descriptor table. This is important, okay? IBM supply a, base, um, a set of RACF classes that are defined in the class descriptor table, ICH, RR, CDX. You can add your own in an assembler table called ICH, RR, CDE, but you can also use the RACF CDT class, the class descriptor table class. Okay. The beauty about the CDT is it's dynamic. You don't need to IPL. Um, CDX and CDE are deemed to be static, so you have to IPL to affect any changes. There's a bit of a cheat there if you want to get into it, but the CDT class is dynamic. So allows us to add or delete our own RACF classes. Okay, you had to assemble it, you had to IPL, and you'd also have to update the RACF router table. Okay, you don't need to do that with the CDT class. Okay, when you are defining your own classes, maximum of eight characters, A through Z, zero through nine. And there is a recommendation, and you see I put must in brackets there with a question mark recommendation that you use zero through nine or the hash at or pound or if you're in the us the dollar sign in your class name the reason for that is ibm say they will never use those characters in a class name so you'll never get a conflict between the classes you might want to define either you as an organization or one of the vendors you buy a product from you will never get a clash with the classes defined by ibm that's the whole idea of it the most fun part of classes is wrapping your head around what we call posit values. And the, 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 sec, the first orange bullet point here, what you do to one, you do to all. And what I mean by that is if you have three classes that share the same posit value, let's say we use posit value 56, 56, 56 and 56 on the three classes. If I activate one, it activates the other two. If I refresh one, it refreshes all three. If I deactivate one, it deactivates all three. So it's a way of grouping classes together. I have seen people get caught out when they haven't paid attention to this and they've deactivated a class that shared a posit value with a whole bunch of kicks transaction classes. 
and they deactivated Kix transaction security when they were trying to de deactivate some old TWS OPCA classes. Yeah, so we can use these ranges 19 to 56, 128 to 5, 527. IBM have reserved these ranges. There's nothing to stop up using them. But remember, if you do, whatever you do to your class, you will do to whatever IBM class shares the same positive value. It's the one thing that will most likely catch you out with this. Bracket started procedure table. ICH RIN 03. Okay. Um, single entry per started task, default entry, IPL. Okay. Can't have that anymore. So IBM invented a number of releases of ZOS, the RACF started class. Now, this allows us to be a bit more generic and we can change, you, um, change using standard RACF profiles, RDefine, RAlter, RACLIST, Refresh, and so on and so forth to manipulate the RACF started class. So if you have a, a started task called KixProd, and you want it to run under the user ID of KixProd, and you want it to have um, the trace option turned on, you define it in the RACF started class. And then when that KixProd started task initializes, it reads the RACF started class, it assigns it uh, a user ID if it can. If for some reason, your, you don't have a profile that matches your started task and you don't have a catch-all at the end of the started, started class profiles, i.e. an aster aster typically, once it gets to the end of all the profiles, it will then drop into and read the RACF started class table, ICH RIN 03. So you can let it trundle down the started class and then go and check ICH RIN 03, or you can let it trundle down the started class and have a default entry at the end of it. I would always recommend that default entry. Let's keep started task management within the started class. We don't need ICH RIN 03, okay? But you've still got to have it there. There's another one here that you will see quite on a, on a on certainly from an or if you're doing an audit or or looking at the system and looking at one of the utilities we'll talk about in a moment called um, DSMON, and it talks about the authorized caller table. It's a way of designating a program to be able to use the rack init and rack list macros whilst not authorized. Used with caution, it should really be empty. But go and have a look at it, okay? I wouldn't expect you as a user of RACF to actually have anything defined in here. You might have something in there from IBM, but you shouldn't have anything defined in, your, in there yourself. I told you this was going to be fairly fast paced. We're at about the midway point. Um, does anybody have any questions? Just while I pause to take breath for a moment. It's all very quiet. No messages in the chat window. Brilliant. So what we'll move on to then is RACF utilities. There are a number of IBM supplied tools for helping us manage the RACF environment. And there's a whole list of them there. Again, you need to go and look at the respective manuals. Some will de be defined in the SysProg guide. Some will be in the admin and auditors guide and so on and, and, and so forth. But here's, um, here's the, the, the ones that, that readily spring to mind. So we're just going to run through two or three of them just to give you a bit of a, a, a look-see to what's there. The first one, and something... you. Know, you, you tend to do very rarely, and that's IRR min zero zero. And basically, IRR min is all about creating a net new RACF database or upgrading the templates on a currently existing RACF database. So on this example here, you can see I've said palm equals new. So I'm going to create marks.sys1.racf. I'm going to put it on a unit of my choice and a volser of my choice. It's going to have a single extent, a number of cylinders. And it literally is IRR min 00, palm new. You have to step lib 
to where the templates are what where do they sit on your system now you might be doing a zos upgrade zos talking to too many americans zos upgrade so you might be running this on your zos 2.4 system but you are building a new RACF database or update, rack, updating the templates on a database for ZOS 2.5. So what you would say here is sys1.templib, comma, disk speak or share, comma, vol equals sir of where your 2.5 templates exist, okay? And whatever JCL you need to be able to locate them. So you say, update this copy of the database, marks.sys1.racf, or create a new one using the 2.5 template. So sys1.linklib is where the templates are if you are initializing or, or updating a RACF database, okay? Um, three, three formats, palm new, palm update, palm activate. Um, update and activate go uh, go in hand typically uh, you don't very really get you don't very often get the chance to create a brand new rack of database unless you're doing a, a a security migration you might be migrating from top secret to acf2 to rack f you might be building a brand new l with a brand new database um, update and activate are all about updating the, um, the, the the templates on the system there the next utility um, the, the little known friend of some of, of, of us folks who are trying to find information on the RACF database, and we don't have a tool such as a Z Secure from IBM or, or um, the, the Vanguard tool set, the administrators and that. So UT100 literally just searches the RACF database for whatever you specify down in this bottom. Yeah, here I've said TSGMW and I've said SIS1. OK, so search the RACF database for anything related to TSGMW and anything related to SIS1. And you get two reports. You get the first one shows you the occurrences of SIS1 and it shows you where that group, because we know it's a group, is on these access lists. It's the create group of a few profiles. It's the first qualifier of SIS1. It's the owner of a profile and it's the first qualifier of profile sys1.smp.o tables now that's a very very cut down list from what you would you would see so that's what it found for that group and then here this is what it found for the user id so it tells you everywhere this user appears whether it's the owner of a profile whether it's in an access list all these things are all there so in the standard access list of general resource profile, TSO auth, palm lib, and so on and so forth. It's a very, very useful utility if you just want something to quickly squirt through the RACF database and show you stuff. Now you won't need this, if I said, if you've got those, you've got those third party tools. IRI UT200, I want to copy a RACF database. Um, UT200, does a like for like copy of the RACF database. If you've got a 10 cylinder database at the start, it will copy it to a 10 cylinder database. You can see here in this example, I'm just writing it to a temporary data set. And the reason I'm doing that is I just wanted to do a quick report through, show me how full it is, and, and I don't really need a copy. So copy it and throw away the copy of the database at the end. Or as it says in the comment here, point it to a real data set, marks.sys1.racf, and it will absolutely copy the database sys1.racf, bit for bit, byte for byte, to your new RACF database and everything there. Now, you'll notice here, I've specified cylinder 20. If my input database is only 10 cylinders, it will allocate a data set of 20, but it will only use the first 10. It does an exact copy of the RACF database. If you want to expand a RACF database or shrink a RACF database, or even split using range or merge using um, UT, you use UT400. So UT400 is used to Extend a database, shrink a database, split a database, or merge a database. They work subtly differently, obviously, but if now 
I specified 10 cylinders and the input database is only five, it will actually format 10 cylinders for me and give me a 10 cylinder database, which is now yeah, five cylinders bigger than the input database. And you might want to do that because you're going to make a load of changes to the RACF database. So depending on what you want to do, you use UT200 or UT400. And there's always a discussion about which one of these databases you, you sorry, which one of these utilities you should use to back up your RACF database on a daily basis. I actually prefer UT400, but I would always run a 200 copy to attempt data set just to check the integrity of the database. You make your own decisions. You look at what one gives you over the others and you make your own choice. So that, they're the kind of the three kind of database utilities for when you're doing the, the administration. So you've got UT100 for search, UT200 to copy like for like, 400 to expand, shrink, split and merge a RACF database. One of the things IBM did a, a few years ago was give us the ability to unload the RACF database or the majority of the RACF database. When I say the majority, it doesn't unload passwords and, and pass tickets and, you know, and stuff like that. Is, yeah, sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong utility. That's coming in a moment. Um, one of the things IBM decided to do was give us the ability to write our own RACF reports. And we needed um, data input for that. And the data we needed most of was, was SMF data. So IBM built a utility called IRRADU00, which is actually two SMF um, dump utility exits written by the RACF team to read the SMF data and write it out in a text format to allow us to um, report on it. You can load the data into DB2 or you can use a whole bunch of sample reports called RACF ICE, I-C-E, as in ICE ICE baby, to be able to read that information. So this is how we get the SMF data, that, that formatted SMF data into a text file that we can then use to report on you 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 will almost certainly be using this but you need access to the smf data so you read in the smf data you can see it here it's simply on the dd name smf data this is the input and out dd this is where i'm going to write the data to and i'm looking at all of the record types zero through two five five and i'm going to call these two exits irradu zero zero and IRRADU86. These two exits are the ones written by the RACF development folks that read the SMF data and create this outdd text file of the, the, uh, the data for you. That's your SMF one. The auditing tool that IBM give us is called DSMAN or ICH DSM 00. I've done a very simple example here that says functional. Functional says run all of the auditor reports. And there's, a, there's about 12 of them, if I remember correctly, 12 or 14 different reports off the top of my head. But basically it's the way that you do that quick and simple audit of the system. Uh, and it lists all the users that have got special and operator and auditor at the system and at the group level. It, it shows you how all your APF libraries are protected. It shows you how your catalog user and master catalogs are protected. It shows you that authorized caller table. That's what you get from um, DSMON. And the one I almost started talking about, but uh, stopped halfway through is IRRDBU00. And this is the database unload example. So reading the RACF database, and unload it to a sequential data set so you can then use it for input into your own reporting tools. IBM provide a set of um, sample jobs to load this stuff into DB2 so you can then go and write your own reports. Um, IBM also supply those ICE reports. So the ICE reports for SMF also have a, um, a, there's a, there's a pair. There's a set of ICE reports for SMF data there's a set of ICE reports for the database unload. So you see the pair, pair of them going hand in hand. You unload the SMF, you unload your database, you run a whole bunch of reports, you get a kind of a sense check of the health of your RACF database. 
the, the final utility that we're going to talk about, again, I, I think it's a, it's a little bit unknown and unloved. Um, and you really wouldn't use this unless you don't have any of those third party tools from IBM or Vanguard. And this is called IRR RID, remove ID. Yeah, IRR read zero zero. It takes at input a copy of the unloaded database. So it's quite often to see a two step batch job that says do the database unload and then run this. What this will do is search that sequential file for the user ID or group specified here at the bottom. I've got TSG MW set and it will build all of the RACF commands to remove TSG MW from that RACF database. Now, apologies. It writes them to this outdd message, tsg.racf irr read 00. So it writes the commands to a sequential data set so you can go and check them. You could then take that data set as input to a simple ikg one batch job. So you could unload, generate the commands and run them all in one step. Oh, sorry, all in one job. I wouldn't advocate that. I would always advocate check the commands first. So it'll do all the permit deletes to remove TSGMW from all the ACLs, all the removes to remove them from all the groups, clean up all the data set profiles with a high level qualifier, do R alter and ALU command and all DSD commands for anything where I was the owner and you need to supply a new owner. And then finally, it will delete the user ID. It's a very, very simple utility, but it works really, really well. We've um, got okay. one question in the chat, Mark, from, uh, from Eamon. Uh, would you unload the database to a Tempo catalog data set for RID00? Zero zero? Um, I think, I think Eamon, it depends um, what you are going to be doing. If I was, if I was going to be doing a lot of RID00, zero zero, I'd unload the database once and just work off that for a period of time. Um, if I'm just going to do it as a one-off job, I'd unload it to a temporary data set and then read because then you know you've got you haven't got the a copy of the database lying around on disk because you don't really want those lying around. So depending on what you're going to do, I, I tend to have both jobs set up. Um, yeah, as I said, if I'm just doing that quick and dirty, unload, remove something, yeah, I'd use a temporary data set. Hope that hope that helps. Right. RACF control blocks, a bit more techie here, okay? So when we start talking about control blocks, we're talking about storage that's mapped by the system that's referenced by the software and users of the software, okay? So you have this thing in, in ZOS called the PSA, yeah? Think of it as first base. That's where everything is anchored off. It's called the prefix save area. Okay. It points to an area called the CVT. From a RACF perspective, it points to two other control blocks. So the CVT is the communications vector table. It points to the RACF communications vector table and the SAF vector table. And we'll come on to SAF a little bit later. So you go from First base, you get to second base, and depending on where you want to go, you go to the RCVT or the SAFV, depending on how you want to trawl the control blocks. You can actually walk these control blocks in RECs and go and dump the information in there. You can use things like ISR DDN to go and walk the control blocks and look at the information in there. Um, the two that we're interested in, yeah, the most, the, the one that we're most interested in, sorry, is, is the RCVT. You get one RCVT per system image, per LPAR, okay? It contains those RACF options created by RACF at IPL time. If you are not running RACF, you will have something that looks like an RCVT that's created by Top Secret or ACF2. It looks like it, but you can actually write code to come in and go to the RCVT and take a look at it and say, oh, I've got a Top Secret one, or oh, I've got a RACF one, or oh, I've got an ACF2 one. And you can adjust your code then based on what you see. 
when you get to the RCVT, it points to loads of other places. Um, it points to the RSDT. That's where the, the, um, the RACF data set descriptor table resigns. You've got the range table. You've got where are the templates. It's got the class descriptor table, the naming conventions table, and so on and so forth. The most interesting one for me that I like to go and play and look at is all of the different RACF exits that are in place. And we're going to look at that in a minute. Okay. So here's a description of what they are. Um, some of the information that's there is, you know, I've got the password options. What's my password history? How often, um, how, um, how regularly do I need to change my password? What RACF classes are active? What ones are rack listed? What ones are um, generic? Processing options. Have I got protect all on? List of groups and so on. So all of this is in storage. There are Rex examples out there how you can write Rex code to go and look at what's there and format it and dump it to you. And why do I say that? Well, for the, uh, for the mildly cur curious or you know, anybody who wants to do a bit of mainframe pen testing, you might not be able to issue the TSO set our ops list command to get all those system commands. That's a restricted command. But there's nothing to stop you writing your own Rex code to go and trawl the control blocks because these are all in storage read readable. So we can go and get them, read the information and format them and store them on the, um, and, and present them back to the user. The one control block that we are fixated with is what's known as the ACEE, -E, the accessor environment element. Basically, this is, yeah, the, it's the, the security, it's the identity of that single task. So whether you're logged on as TSO, a TSO user, TSGMW, I have an ACEE -E for TSGMW. If I've got a task that's running as Kix Prod, I have an ACEE -E called Kix Prod. So it's one per tasks. They exist for the life of that, the, the active session. So if you're logged on to TSO, it's there all the time you're logged on to TSO. It's what we use for all of those security calls. And it's technically not a RACF control block. It's an MVS one because it's actually mapped by an MVS um, um, macro, I-H-A-A-C-E-E. -E. Um, this is the one, if you want to get in there and do that bit, bit twiddling and bit flipping yeah, to make yourself system special when you're not, this is where you go. You've got to get to the AC. Now, you can't just do that. And I'm not going to give you any more hints on that. We'll do that another day. But it's a really, really interesting control block if you want to try and map a system and understand how people are set up. There's different ways to get to it. It depends on um, how, the, how the address space was, was built. But ultimately, you want to be able to con um, trawl the control blocks and get to your ACEE. -E. Um, if ever you write any code that manipulates an ACE, and what I mean by that, if you create one, then you must delete it. What I can absolutely tell you is if you do not did not create the ACE, do not delete it. Because I can tell you address spaces get rather upset if you delete their ACE. -E. Okay, thanks, David. Got that time warning, 15 minutes to go. We're going at it hard here. Okay, so a little bit of control block for you. Um, the thing about control blocks is, you know, as I said, you can map it with, with Rex, and there are a load of great examples out there for, um, for learning how this, how this hangs together and how to walk the control blocks. So the next thing, RACF macros. So as a developer of software, I want to write a piece of software that interacts with RACF. Okay. To do that, I use the RACF macros. There are a number of them. Rack in it, verification, validate a user ID and password and build an ACE. There are some interesting parameters on the RACF. One of them that says hmm, no password. So I can build an ACE without checking the checking the password of a user ID. That's quite interesting. But to be able to do that, you've got to be authorized and, and authorized and non-authorized and all that. That's that's for an, another day. But suffice it to say, 
There are a bunch of macros supplied by IBM that allow us to interact directly with RACF. Okay. And they all do slightly different things. Yeah. Rack in it, create and delete their ACE authorization. Yeah. Do I do, I do a, a define? Do I want to do a fast authorization check? I use the profiles in storage. Or do I want to just do a, a, an authorization check for a profile that exists on the RACF database, depending on what you're doing? Now, if you want to do a fray check, yeah, that fast auth, you've actually got to have listed the profiles, or RACF's got to have listed the profiles for you. Okay, so lots and lots of lots of different yeah RACF macros, and I'm cutting past this quite quickly. Okay, um, this is what they do. There is one macro um, that stands out on its own, and that's called ICH INT, and this is literally direct RACF database access. You must use this with extreme caution. IBM don't normally recommend it. They'd recommend using the rack root request equals extract that we're going to come on to in a moment. But you've got to have an extensive knowledge of the RACF database and the associated templates if you want to start playing around with this because you can extract profiles, but you can also write profiles back to the database. And trust me, you can get into uh, um, you, you can get yourself into trouble if you're not extremely careful. OK, however, as it says here, sometimes it's the only way to fix a problem. So these here are all the direct RACF macros. But you've also got a set of top secret direct access modules, macros, and then also a set for ACF2. So what we were faced with many years ago were software developers who were writing code yeah, writing that resource manager code would have to write code that supported both RACF, ACF2, and top secret. That meant the development overhead and the management of the code was, you know, high. It was it was not difficult to do. It was just yeah, it was just time consuming. So IBM actually introduced what we call the SAF interface commonly known as rack root so now the resource manager talks to talks RACF, talks via saf and each of the products install their own little bit of code into what's known as the saf router to say i'm here and i'm RACF, or i'm here and i'm acf2 or top secret and that piece of code handles the translation with some parameters in the software product to be able to allow the the resource manager developers the ability to just code it once and rack FACF2 and top secret take care of the rest. I would say 90 plus, probably 95% of all the code out there these days uses rack root. You might come across a piece of code that talks directly to rack F or ACF2 or top secret. Um, but you'd have to have that conversation with the developers of the code, yeah, developers of that resource manager. Um, there's a whole manual on this, on the Rack Root manual. Um, it's pretty heavy going and heavy reading. Um, but once you understand it, you've got a couple of working examples, um, writing code that interfaces to any of the security products becomes very, very easy. OK. So. We're getting towards the end now. So I'm just going to finish off um, with, a, with a few charts around um, RACF exits. Now, for those who don't know what a, an, an exit is, a 10,000 foot view, very simplified view of the world. IBM provide us um, code that goes A to B to C to D to E to F to G to H. They write the code for us. We have no influence over that. We cannot change that. But what they do is give us what are known as exit points, where we can go from A to B to C. We can call our exit, do our piece of processing, and then come back in line and carry on with D, E, F, G, break out and do our piece of work in our exit, and then come back in and carry on with H. So it's a way for us of users of the software to inject our own logic into why, the way things work. RACF is no different. 
there are a number of exit points. Okay, um, you won't see all of these being used, um, but you may see one or two of them. So there are quite a few of them, you, and a lot of them come in pairs, RIXO1 and RIXO2. So RIXO1 is the rack in it pre-processing exit, RIXO1, and RIXO2 is the post processing exit. So RIXO1 is where I get to see all of the code that's coming into the rack in it before the rack in it is performed. So I could change something. And RIXO2 are the results from the rack in it. So in that rack in it, RIXO2, you might see that Mark's entered an invalid password. You could do something with that. You could set a return code that says, actually, I'm going to let Mark sign on with any password he wants. It doesn't matter. I put some code in RIXO2 that tells me to drive RIXO1 again. But this time, don't check Mark's password. Pass check equals no. And just build the ACEE. -E. I know that one quite intimately because I actually wrote some code for a client years ago. Long story, it's not the best bit of code that we should have been doing, but yeah, that's what you can do pre and post RCX01, RCX02, before a rack F check, after a rack F check. I've got another message in the window. Yeah, sorry, Mark, it's a five minute answer. time. Five minute five time check. Yeah. Thank you, David. So, yeah, RCX02. So you remember that we talked about that resource manager. What about if somebody's installed an RCX02 exit that says if it's Monday and it's between the hours of nine to five and the user ID is TSGMW, you see that return code eight you've got there, change that return code eight to return code zero and pass it back to the resource manager. The resource manager now believes Rakev said yes. This is how funky you can get with these things. There's a whole bunch of them here for you know, checking check everything as, as, we, as, we, um, as we go through. There's you know, password exits, ICHPWX01, um, ICHPWX11, the passphrase. There's, there's all different ones here that you can do. These are all reported by DSMON. It will tell you which rack of exit you've got in place. Okay. When you code them, most of them today are written in assembler, but you can write them in C if you want. Um, they've got to um, reside in a link pack area, whatever flavor you want. Um, they've got to be refresh and refreshable and re-enterable. Okay. Read that up in the books. Um, I've got a whole set of um, slides on rack FX. It's down to writing the code. And as I mentioned at the start, I'd be more than happy to come back and do a few more of these for you if you want. David, you will be pleased to know that is two minutes ahead of schedule. OK, I now need a coffee. Much. So what, what I would say is I know that was a lot of information. I will make the charts available to, to Dave and Chris so they can upload them on the website so you, you, can, get a, you can get a copy of them. And, and I sincerely mean this. If anybody yeah, is interested in doing more of this, feed it back to Dave and Chris. I am quite happy to spend an hour on each of these different subjects and even do hands-on demos and show you how you do, do some of these stuff. Um, outside of presenting, you obviously, I guess some of you will know, I, I'm, I'm part of the team that organises GSE in the UK. If you're not a GSE member company, we would love you to become GSE, GSE members. There are some benefits. One of them is the ability to download the recording of this session and or the, um, the, uh, the, the PDF of, of the session. Um, if you really liked what you heard, yeah, we are doing a, a charity collection for the Guide Dogs for the Blind and RLNI. So if you've got a virgin money, do a little bit of a donation. You'll get a receipt number, load the receipt number and the amount you donated onto the GSE website. You'll be entered into a, um, a charity raffle. And then finally, um, feedback. Good, bad or indifferent. The session code is 6AS. 
there are my contact details. Um, yeah, feel free to drop me a note. As I said, I'd be more than happy to do more of this. David, Chris, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mark. Um, yeah, reiterate what you said. Uh, please feed that back if you want to see more of this in the in the 102 stream, and we're going to look to work with Mark to get that arranged. Um, I put the uh, link for feedback for this talk in the chat. Uh, please, please, can everybody um, give the feedback as it uh, helps make us um, make a, a greater conference as we can. Uh, I think that I'll uh, I'll wrap the meeting up. If that, um, if you're happy, Mark. Thank you very much. No, thank you, thank you all for turning up, and as I said, um, reach out if you would like any more. Thank you all.